guys heard of the term invisible disability or hidden disability before? Raise your hand. OK. Who here feels a little uncomfortable or awkward talking about disability in any form? I know I do. I, personally, it's a little, it's, a, it's one of those things that it's a little weird. It's an uncomfortable conversation that we need to have. And so thank you for having me here today, because this could be uncomfortable. If it feels uncomfortable at any point, you're in the right place and you're doing the right thing. 88% of the women I surveyed do not disclose their invisible disability as part of the job application process. That really long, ugly form where we say that we're a woman and that we don't know if we're a military member, all of those things. So 88%. So I mean, 12%, cool, you know something good. I don't know about you. I know for my organization, I'm a big diversity and inclusion advocate. We're trying to increase our diversity in a number of different realms. And it's really hard if people aren't identifying. And disability is a huge identifier. And by the way, all the numbers that I'm going to cite today are from my research in this topic, so just FYI. Um, this means that there's a real big lack of trust in the organization. There's a fear of discrimination right up front, right in the application process. They say, eh, this makes me feel uncomfortable. And there's not a safe space in your office, in your environment. These are just a few invisible disabilities that are out there. If you go on the internet, you're going to find a lot more. Um, it's purposely small because there's an insane amount going on. The biggest thing you should note from this list is not all of these are considered disabilities under the eyes of the US government. And this is a huge part of discrimination, and this is a huge part of not having a safe workspace. Because if you're on here, but the government doesn't recognize that, how am I going to ask for an accommodation in your workplace? So this started for me, uh, this research, in 2017. I'm here with my roommates. We're throwing a party. I have a giant shrimp pillow that I brought back from Thailand. It is the second thing I'd save in a fire next to my cat. <laughs> um, you know, I look pretty happy. I'm doing my thing. Um, reality, button. Um, I was depressed, I was exhausted, I was tired, I was in this place where I just couldn't do anything. My long-term boyfriend had just broken my heart, I got a bad and unwarranted performance review at work, I was just struggling and I just said, you know, who else has felt like this? Somebody else, nobody's talking about this, why are people not talking about this? And I reached out to my communities and specifically my women-only communities, I said, who else has felt like this? Why, why are we be keeping quiet about this? And so the response I got was overwhelming. Um, come on, there we go. Uh, people said they felt the same. They were discouraged. They didn't know where to go. They had gone to these female-only communities because it was the only safe space to go to. Um, and they didn't feel validated in their disability, oftentimes because it wasn't a disability in the eyes of the government. So I interviewed 10 women who immediately posted on my Facebook post and said, thank you for talking about this. And I wanted to know what was going on. Where are these commonalities with these people? How, how can I find this group that I can you know, be a part of this community? I found three core themes, which I'll address a little bit later on, within this group that came up time and time and time again and continued to come up throughout my research. And then I submitted to speak at Grace Hopper, the holy grail of tech conferences for women, the most progressive thing out there. I was so excited. I was just beginning my journey on public speaking, and I was like, Grace Hopper, I got this. And, you know, of course, I got rejected. And I said, well, what the fuck is going on? This is something we need to talk about. This is women in tech. This is me. This is my community. I have something important to say. And what they told me is this, and this is an exact quote. And I summarize it as, we don't know enough about this topic to let you present on this topic because our audience won't understand the topic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and here it is, the most progressive women's tech conference, potentially in the world, is saying, we don't know enough about it and our community won't understand it. Our community of women. According to the CDC, in 2017, 27% of women identified with a disability in some form, whether physical or invisible. And those are only the people who are talking about it who are willing to identify themselves. So if one in four, how many is that in this room alone? You know, I come out, I have depression and anxiety. I'm pretty open about it. I talk a lot about it. It was part of this. And, you know, I'm fortunate that I can talk about it. You know, if you talk to my partner, he always says, you know, you're so brave to go up and talk about it. Well, you know, whatever. This is who I am. This is part of my life. I'm fortunate enough to be in a workspace at Quartet Health where I can have a day, and I just need to take a day. But Going back to Grace Hopper, they said, you know, we can't have this, not here. 
So I was frustrated and really disheartened. Um, I'm very much the kind of person when something doesn't go my way, I say, well, I don't agree with that. How do I get around that? How do I keep going? I'm taking action. And so I said, okay, 10 people, not enough. I need to make this bigger. What next? So I created a Google form, just like everybody else does in the world. And I said in a big caveat at the beginning that I'm just a woman who has depression and anxiety. I'm going through this. I want to know about this. I got rejected from Grace Hopper. I want your thoughts. I want to know who you are. I don't have any money to offer you. This is a you know, an, a potentially anonymous Google form. Let me know what's going on. And I received 102 responses in seven days. It was over 100 pages of content when I downloaded the qualitative responses. This community was crying out for support. And they were saying, nobody has even asked us how we're feeling. And I was the first person, and I got all this content. Well, I was totally blown away. I was totally overwhelmed and said, shit, I can't do this anymore. Like, I, I'm not a researcher. I'm not an academic. I'm just a person who is feeling a certain way. 43% of women in my surveys said that they have asked for a reasonable accommodation in some form. That does not mean that they've, diet, that they've disclosed their disability, but they're asking for accommodations. So almost 50% are saying, yes, I need something. That means that there are people who are struggling with invisible disabilities in your workplaces right now. That's a huge thing. You need to recognize that this community is in your communities. It is in your workplaces. Hidden productivity issues. I know if I'm having a bad day, I'm not productive. If you can just let me go home and sleep it off or do what I need to do, I'm going to come back that next day twice as productive, if not more. What are you doing to provide accommodations? How are you doing this proactively? I know at my workspace, we have desks, uh, the, the desks that move up and down. So we can have a standing desk if we want. We offer up to a $250 stipend for anybody who works remotely to create their space. So how are you doing things proactively and articulating it in advance to allow people to know it's OK to ask? You can do this. We're open to this. So the three commonalities that I mentioned before in the survey, the first one was their coping skills became their superpowers. There was one woman, she um, suffered from narcolepsy. And she said in college, she would go to class and she'd fall asleep and go to class. And everybody thought she was a slacker. They told her to stop partying. It was incredibly disappointing. She had to learn everything. And she was a software engineer on her own. She then you know, took that skill into the workplace and was able to pick up new languages, new frameworks, move forward in her career as a software engineer because she learned the skill. And she had to learn that skill because she couldn't pay attention in class because she would fall asleep. So these skills become their superpowers. Stunted career growth. If you aren't able to be in the workplace and accommodate to the traditional nine to five, you're not going to do well. Most of the women I talked to ended up doing side hustles or entrepreneurship because they couldn't be confined into the box of the workplace that, that was be being given to them. So all of a sudden, you're talking about 50% of the population in the workplace not being able to move forward. You wonder why we don't have as many women in the C-suite? Well, maybe we should talk, start talking about disability. And safe and supportive communities, and specifically female-centric communities. Males, men, anybody else on the gender spectrum, you are our allies. You are a part of the solution. But having singular gender communities only is still very important and part of this process. So moving forward to last year, I got this new job at Quartet Health. I'm super excited. I have a supportive boss. I have a supportive team. It's great. And I say, OK, I need to refresh this, this survey. I need to figure out what more I can do. So I refreshed it. I made it a little bit more quantitative. And I got 202 responses in two weeks. And I got my first troll. Somebody took 25 minutes to fill out the survey just to say that it was worthless. So it was great. I took that with a lot of pride. So here's really where I get to the crux of what everybody here can do. And I go back to that being proactive. Putting these policies in place creates the space for these people that identify. And all of the things I talk about here are good for business. This is good for your bottom line, because ultimately, we all want to make money at the end of the day. We want to do good for our people. But this is a capitalistic society. It's the way it is. Three policies that you should make sure that you have at your organization if you want to attract women with invisible disabilities. Comprehensive health care. 66% of women said having comprehensive, and I mean beyond dental, beyond the medical, beyond the basic vision health care. What are you doing for mental health benefits? What are you doing for disability benefits beyond the standard? Think about where you can go and where you can push the boundaries on your health care benefits. Quartet Health gives me a $50 stipend for every time I go to the therapist. So that covers my copay. 
I can go to get mental health care benefits for free, and thank goodness, because my therapist, I need her. That's part of my life. Generous paid leave. We were talking at our table um, during one of the talks that one of the biggest failures companies have is saying, free vacation, have it in a limited vacation. We love you. Take it. It's the opposite happens. People take less vacation. Why not implement a minimum vacation? Why not say to all of your managers, make sure all of your employees take at least one week a quarter off, and at least three of those days should be consecutive? What would that look like if you just said, we actually implement a minimum vacation policy. Everybody has to take four weeks a year. That's pretty bold. But in reality, it's good for business. Your people are going to be more well rested. They're going to be there. And remote working options. We just heard a great talk on some, some options if you're going to have a fully remote team. But that is also partially remote. What does it look like if you have to go to doctor's appointments or go to therapy appointments? Or you know, these are women. We're primarily the you know, people taking care of our children. You know, Having that flexibility to say, I'm going to work from home today. I just need my day, I need to do my thing, or maybe I need to work different hours because I have a migraine and I just can't do lights, or maybe every office in America that has the awful fluorescence, you know, being able to have those spaces. And again, creating the space where this is something that you're putting out there. We love our people to work from home once a week. It really allows them to reset and they can take their time and they don't have to put on pants. It's great. <laughs> so these are things that are really easy, but women are actively looking for these three when they're ready to tr switch jobs. Retaining women. So you have these women in your workplace. You want to keep them there because they're vital talent. They're doing great things, even if they're not out with their disability. The big things that they're concerned about is an unstable work-life integration. This is not about balance. Balance is on here, but it's about integration because everything is in our lives. I you know, have my cell phone in my back pocket. I'm checking my email every 30 seconds. That's going to be the way of the life as we go. But if I can't take time off to go to an appointment, if I can't do something that I need, if I can't take a moment and I don't see the people in my leadership doing that, it makes me want to leave immediately. I want to just get out of there. High stress working environments. You can get a lot done. You can put prioritization. But it doesn't mean it has to be stressful. Quartet, I don't think I've ever felt any stress. Some pressure when there's deadlines, but not stress. And there's a big difference. And I go home. And I can do my thing, and I can relax, and I can be the human being that I need to be. And I go back to work, and I kill it at work. I am so good at my job, but not because there's stress. No clear levels, career pathing, and pay parity. Everybody here heard the term pay parity? Yeah? Everybody gets pay, equal pay? By not having these explicitly outlined, and this should seem like a basic. Everybody should have this. HR should have this for everybody. It is not a given. If it's a given in this community, kudos. But it's not a given in the, in the rest of the world. Having explicit and transparent structures saying, if you're here and you want to get to here, here are these three hops you need to do. Every manager should be trained on how to get somebody to point A to point B. And if they're not, they need to know who in HR they need to go to. But I want to be able to go to my Confluence page and pull it up and be like, oh, cool, there it is. Actually, I hate Confluence. I don't want to go to my Confluence page. But that's because I work in people ops and I'm not in the tech world. Um, and pay parity. If you can publish internally or externally, what's going on with your pay structures? How do you determine if somebody gets a raise? What are the variants between men and women or in, and between people who are LGBTQ or not, between different races? This isn't just about gender, because these things work across the entire spectrum of what we now call diversity in demographics. So by having these explicitly in place, somebody says, I know that they're worried about my growth and they want to see me go. I know they want to promote me. I know they want me to get there because they've outlined exactly what it is. So what can you do? You know, this is kind of a Debbie Downer topic, potentially. It's like, oh, god, disabilities, women, ugh, like tough life. But this is the reality of our world. <laughs> this is the reality. So recognize. Recognize that there are people and women in, in your organization today who have invisible disabilities. And they're probably not going to disclose. It's scary. There's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of ugh around it. People can develop disabilities and kind of ebb and flow out of them. Technically, we consider pregnancy a disability. If you're pregnant, you take short-term disability. <laughs> so recognize that the people in your organization are important, regardless of that, that they have skills, that keeping, retaining these people is a return on your investment. If you lose somebody after a year, the return on investment isn't very high. But if you can keep that person for two, three years, the math is there. Empathize. Can you lead with empathy and say, People are going through stuff. 
I don't know what this person next to me is going through, but I think they're having a bad day, and I'm just going to be gentle, and I'm going to treat them with care, and start at that point. It's really hard if you're having a bad day, or that's just not your mindset. So the more you can just say, I don't know what they're going through, that's a huge starting point. It also helps foster community. If you as a leader can talk about that and say, I'm having a bad day, or this is happening, whatnot, and I'm going to be here. Lead by the example, which is the next one. You're all leaders within your organization, whether you want to be or not. You come to these conferences, you're a leader, point blank. You're, you're doing growth. So lead by example. Talk about what you're going through. I encourage anybody who has an invisible disability, if you're in a workplace, talk about it. Get other people to talk about it. I know I talk about it, and people are like, oh, man, I feel that too. Or I was diagnosed with this, or I'm having issues with that. By sharing and creating this space for other people, it's, gonna, it's only going to be good for you. It's only going to encourage people to be more involved in your organization. Programming. Comprehensive health care is big. In the United States, we have one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. Things are not comprehensive. What can you do to be inclusive of everybody's health care needs? And yes, there is a cost associated with this. There's a cost associated with everything. But there are health care plans. There are EAPs. There are tons of platforms out there. You know, what does it look like to be more inclusive of pregnancy? There's a company called Maven that specifically works with, um, I believe, with pregnant women and getting them the insurance and help they need. What about fertility? How, Quartet offers $5,000 a year in fertility benefits. What would it look like to offer $5,000 for somebody who might be transitioning? What does that mean to your community that you're saying outright, potentially on that job application, that we offer these things because we want you here? These are all huge pieces that ultimately lead for everybody working better together. And the reality is, is if you offer $5,000 a year per person for fertility benefits, three people in a company of 300 will probably take it. So what's $15,000 a year? In the, in the scheme of things, if that person is going to stay maybe another year. I know I want to freeze my eggs. I've been putting it off for six months. But I'm going to keep staying at Quartet for other reasons. But even if I were ready to leave, I'm going to stay there until I can use that benefit. <laughs> Seriously, if it's retention. You know, Obviously, you want me engaged in other things, and that's a whole different topic for another day. <laughs> But these things are, you know, get your brain thinking creatively about, and you know, you have this, these people, what are other people doing? Ask what programming they have. Look at other people's job descriptions to see what they're offering. Steal that content from them. Don't, create the, don't recreate the world. But there are organizations out there that you can partner with to help for everybody in there. Have difficult conversations. Every time I talk about my own disability, every time I talk about it, it's, ugh, it, it's squirmy, it makes me feel weird, I get anxious sitting there, I just like, I get in my own head. That's part of this, is just talking about it over and over and over again. There, as long as you keep talking about it, it will get better. As long as you open up the floor for people to say, yeah, disability makes me feel uncomfortable. Ugh, like, I don't know why, it just does. And actually, Harvard has some great implicit bias tests that you can do online that are really fast. Highly, highly, highly recommend everybody check it out if you just Google Harvard implicit bias. They're excellent. But talk about microaggressions. Have employee resource groups, ERGs, or affinity groups. Do executive training. If you take away nothing from today, do executive training on microaggressions and biases. Show that it matters at the top so the people at the bottom recognize that and then provide it all the way through. It's a trickle down and grow up situation. And use data, measure, and ask questions. It's OK not to have all the answers. This is a complicated and very strange world we live in, in these days. Ask questions. Know what's going on. We have a bunch of ERGs at Quartet that I'm kind of the HR liaison for. And I'm constantly saying, oh, I didn't know you feel that way. How can I help? How can I put in processes in place that will make you feel better? Oh, you want a question on the engagement survey? We can get that. And all of a sudden, that I've you know, empowered this entire community by just saying, how can I help? So keep asking questions. Open up the dialogue. It is hard. It's going to feel weird. And it'll feel less weird each and every time. So that's it. Invisible disabilities in women. Ultimately, what you do for that population is going to be good for your entire company in the bottom line. This is, a, this is, a all, this is a creating a community. But really recognize that women are 50% of the workforce. Women are leaving if you don't address these issues. And if you ignore them, they'll go away. What happens if 50% of your female population just left tomorrow? How many people would you have to hire? How many people would you have to train? 
How many people would you have to say, oh, crap, I have to do this? Or maybe you don't have HR, and you have to do it as the boss. So think about this community. Be creative. Talk to your peers, because it matters, and they matter, and we matter. Thank you.